Today, I'm counting down the top 20 most disgusting moments Hell's Kitchen has ever seen. And what this contestant did turned into, as Ramsay would put it, a bloody mess. Quite literally. So this is the exotic tartare dish by Matt Siegel from season four. He was boasting to the cameras about how his dish was gonna rock Ramsay's world. And I think it did, but not in a way he was expecting. So what was so exotic about it, do you ask? It was a mind-boggling combo of raw venison, diver scallops, caviar, and, wait for it, grated white chocolate. Ramsey couldn't believe his ears and questioned if he was being punked. I mean, what were you smoking to come up with this combination? Man, I got secondhand embarrassment watching this. Oh, that was ruthless. Now, you'd think this would bring Matt's ego down a notch, right? Well, think again. Matt, bless his heart, couldn't comprehend what Ramsey found so repulsive about his creation. The poor guy was genuinely perplexed. To be fair, Matt, you put white chocolate on seafood. Like, white chocolate on seafood. Duh! Does that ring a bell, or should I ring it for you? But at least Matt cooked it through. Unlike this next contestant who was so overconfident that he ended up not cooking his dish enough. In season 11, episode 10, during the quinceanera planning challenge, John Scallion had a word with Michael Langdon, reminding him to ensure that his meat was prepared in time since the clock was ticking away. Determined, Michael took charge and prepared a steak dish, becoming the final contender from the blue team to present his creation up for judgment. He was up against Amanda Giblet, and Ramsay actually liked her dish. Michael, however, felt that his flavors were superior. But were they? Let's hear it. You know what they call that? Bald-faced lies. Upon closer inspection, it was evident that the steak was severely undercooked. Oh, the horror. Blood still lingered on the plate, signaling that the dish was far from being ready. While Michael insisted it wasn't blood, the truth was hard to ignore. I mean, what do you think this is? His dish was promptly criticized for its raw and undercooked state, much to Michael's frustration. I don't know about you, but this made me throw up, and I think I can't eat steaks for a few weeks now. Not exaggerating even a bit. And by the way, I had a field day learning about all the bacteria that raw meat is contaminated with. When ingested, they can make you really sick. Like, really, really sick. I am talking diarrhea, stomach cramps, vomiting, and a fever, as per the CDC. This can strike between 6 and 24 hours after eating raw, undercooked meat. And it lasts between 24 hours and many days, depending on the type of bacteria. So yeah, Chef Michael, for the sake of your family's health, I hope you're only taking over grilling duties whenever there's a barbecue. Now it's time to meet Krissa Schmerler. She may have seemed kind-hearted, but let's just say Hell's Kitchen wasn't exactly her cup of tea. Spoiler alert, in the 14th season, she landed a not-so-impressive 18th place. So that should tell you a lot about her culinary expertise. She presented a ginger-crusted chicken breast during the signature dish challenge inspired by, wait for it, the cookie aisle at the grocery store. Yep. You heard that right. Ramsey couldn't help himself and covered his face, bursting into uncontrollable laughter. And guess what? The entire audience joined in, turning poor Chris's moment into an awkward laugh fest. Oh, the embarrassment. Ramsey couldn't help but make a cheeky remark. I mean, he couldn't even manage to swallow one bite. Clearly, that was an abomination, and she just scored one point out of five. To make matters worse, Krissa even told the cameras that she's not used to people spitting out her food. Honestly, I felt bad for her here. Tough break, Krissa. But what you served was simply inedible. Oh, by the way, this reminds me of something similar that happened in season 16, when Jessica Boynton nervously took her place as the eighth contestant against Andrew Pierce from the red team to face Ramsey's judgment. Little did she know that her risotto dish was about to take an unexpected turn. Ah, it's okay, chefs. Spit happens. I, I mean, shit happens. And this is no big deal in Hell's Kitchen, as each and every day turns out to be a learning experience. But this time, someone decided to teach Ramsey a few things. And that's when we meet Miss Manners. 
That would be Colleen Cleek. Her misguided confidence and overpriced instruction made her infamous. And did I mention that she was a cooking instructor despite not being formally trained? I can almost hear the collective gasp and see the raised eyebrows in the room. And how much does she charge? I don't think you're ready for this. How much do you charge? 300 per three to four hours. Wait. What? So she's not a trained chef herself, but she charges that outrageous amount to teach what exactly? Does she mean people pay her for this? Her signature dish was smoked chicken enchiladas with poblano cream sauce, and it was an epic culinary fail. You can guess how bad it was when Ramsay says this. You seriously charge $300 to teach people how to make that crap? Needless to say, he wasn't impressed, and neither is the internet. Colleen, already in a precarious situation, struggled to keep her mouth shut. But she couldn't resist the temptation and blurted out this. I teach manners too, chef. Oh god, the audacity. She really thought she owned GR, huh? But everyone's a gangsta until Ramsay says, Okay, please, Miss Manners, fuck off back in line. Obviously, she couldn't, and a frustrated Ramsay told her to step back in line. Now, that's what I call a total disaster, folks. Speaking of disasters, remember this episode in season three where Jen Yamola went dumpster diving? Yep, she retrieved the spaghetti she had thrown out in the garbage and proceeded to wash it. She almost actually cooked it again and claimed she would have served it too. That's easily one of the worst food offenses. So what happened is that Joanna Dunn was about to kill someone by serving rancid crab. So Ramsay threw her out and put Jen and Julia on the appetizer station. They were able to get some dishes out, but after she tossed out cooked spaghetti which she thought were not needed, what do you know? Ramsay asked for some on the very next ticket. In a panic, she grabbed some tossed spaghetti from the trash, but all thanks to Julia who stopped Jen dead in her tracks with absolutely no hesitation at all. At least someone was thinking straight. Indeed. Jen's lucky Ramsay didn't catch her. The comments on the Hell's Kitchen channel show how angry the viewers were. Some believe that she should have been 86th from the show after this incident. Others question that if she was willing to do this on camera, imagine what her hygiene standards are when nobody's watching. Yeah, food for thought, right? I can't understand what it is with all these contestants taking shortcuts. And here comes another one. You absolutely cannot cook a proper gumbo in 45 minutes. But Antonia Bregman from season 8 tried anyway. As you would expect, her Mardi Gras gumbo turned out to be a culinary catastrophe of epic proportions. When she proudly unveiled the dish to Ramsay, it was met with sheer shock and disbelief. Despite describing it as a plate of liquid shit, he bravely took a bite. What could go wrong, right? Well, everything. It was inedible. Even people on the internet are convinced that it must have tasted like actual shit or worse. And then this happened. Have you tasted that? No, I didn't get a chance to taste it, chef. Seriously? Who in their right mind wouldn't taste their own dish before getting it judged by Ramsay? That's a risky move in a high stakes competition like Hell's Kitchen. To add insult to injury, Ramsay decided to subject the rest of the contestants to Antonia's gastro adventure. If it wasn't already bad that he got sick. And now, he decided to share that misery with Antonia's competitors. To put it mildly, none of them were impressed. Rob took the opportunity to unleash his creative criticism, saying this. It was completely repulsive. I would have rather had a cat shit in my mouth than have eaten that any further. Nona and Boris weren't faring any better, with the flavors threatening to send them over the edge. Even Vinny couldn't find any redeeming qualities, likening it to slurping down a big ol' bowl of mud. Easily one of the worst, most repulsive dishes served on the show. If hell is real, I am sure in the ninth circle, they make you eat this. Obviously, she earned no points, and Ramsay declared it as the worst dish of the day, leading the red team to lose the signature dish challenge. And what a way to lose a challenge. While scrolling through the net, I found this Reddit user by the name StreetCommunity922, who asked viewers a million dollar question. 
Between Matt from Season 4's Exotic Tartar and Antonia from Season 8's Gumbo, which was the worst signature dish in your opinion? The responses on the thread are hilarious, and an overwhelming number of them think that the answer's Matt. They say that Antonia at least had a concept that was executed horrifically. Matt's dish was awful, from conceptualization to execution. What do you think? Which dish would you rather taste? As for me, I'll just pass, thank you. Anyway, speaking of disgusting dishes, I think I'd spontaneously combust out of embarrassment if I had to present something as hideous as this. Wow. Props to Jen to stand there and take in all the criticism without hurling excuses because she had nothing to do with that lame-ass duck breast. That was all on Melissa Furpo. You see, what happened is during the wedding planning challenge in season three, Melissa proposed a change that left everyone raising their eyebrows. Instead of sticking with lamb, she suggested the women should go quackers and use duck as the main dish. Jen, being the cautious one, expressed concerns about cooking time. But the team ultimately went with Melissa's decision, because she was being very bossy about it. How I wish they didn't, but the damage was done. When it came to preparing the duck breast, Julia confidently decided to sear it. However, Melissa quacked in with a different idea, leaving poor Julia feeling a bit plucked. Not only that, Melissa also managed to throw a few feathers at Bonnie Moorhead along the way. It was enough to make anyone feel a bit ruffled, with conflicting instructions taking flight in the kitchen. Amidst all the squabbling, Julia took the duck breast out of the oven to let it rest. But in a moment of kitchen confusion, she accidentally placed it right back in to keep it warm. What followed was more squawking and bickering. Even Rock, with his keen ears, couldn't help but hope that the feathery argument between the Hell's Bietches would lead to their downfall. I mean, just look at him, you guys. So, as the cooking reached its crescendo, Julia and Melissa discovered their unfortunate truth. The duck breast was overcooked. But did Melissa take responsibility? Nope. When Ramsay asked both the teams if they were happy, the woman squawked in unison that they were not. Julia, pointing her culinary finger, blamed Melissa, claiming she had been acting like a kitchen dictator. Melissa, however, defended herself asserting that she wasn't trying to juggle everything at once. Ramsey swiftly reminded her that he never appointed her as head chef, emphasizing that the challenge was all about teamwork. It was time to break free from those ducking egos. D sorry, autocorrect. I think you heard it right, though. As the news broke that the wedding couple would be tasting their creations alongside GR, Melissa's feathers stood on end. She was horrified. Desperately trying to convince GR, dishes should be kept under lock and key. But GR turned a deaf ear to her concerns. The show must go on. It was a humiliating experience for the entire red team. And let's be honest, the blue team winning that challenge, ah, too easy. There was no competition at all. And well, Rock kinda already knew about this outcome, right? He was just as confident as Royce Wagner during the intense four-ingredient challenge in season 10. The only difference being, Royce Wagner's confidence backfired. You see, Royce had set his sights on the luxurious lobster as the star of his dish. His masterpiece? A whole poached lobster infused with saffron and thyme. After taking a bite of his own creation, he seemed very convinced that it was freaking delicious. As the final blue team member to face the judges, Royce squared off against Christina Wilson. Little did he know, a hairy situation was about to unfold. Douglas Keane discovered this. A long hair lurking within the dish sent shockwaves of disgust through the room. An irritated Clemenza Caserta couldn't help but ask why anyone would dare to serve a hair-infested dish to a Michelin star chef. Yeah, pretty gross, right? Ramsey, never one to mince his words, demanded an explanation from Royce. Royce, perplexed and caught off guard, claimed innocence, insisting he had no idea how the hair found its way into his creation. But wait, there was more. Michael Simarusti, like a culinary detective, revealed that the lobster still had its not-so-appetizing shit sack intact. Yikes, there goes my appetite for dinner. Clearly, Royce's dish fell short of expectations. He managed to score only three stars, leaving the team astounded. 
Meanwhile, Kimmy, in a moment of pure disbelief, couldn't help but ask this. Royce just served hair and a shit sack to Michelin star chefs. Like, what the f are you thinking, dude? Same question, Kimmy. I have the same bloody question. Up next, though, is Michael Mike Aresta. And ah, uh, where do I even begin? He stepped up to the plate as the fourth contestant from the blue team in season 12. He faced off against Kashia, hoping to impress the discerning palate of GR. Little did he know, his dish was about to hit a rather cheesy bump. Mike proudly presented his creation, a plate of tortellini with tomatoes. However, when GR inquired about the filling for his tortellini, Mike's confession left everyone a bit shell-shocked. The interrogation continued as Ramsey pressed him about the tomato sauce. Mike reluctantly revealed that he had used canned tomatoes. Man, that's a lazy attempt. The disappointment in his eyes was palpable as he angrily tossed the dish into the trash, dismissing it as a joke. Can you even blame him? Gabriel couldn't help but question why on earth Mike would serve Ramsey packaged food. Yeah. Anyone who knows Ramsey knows how much he hates canned food. I mean, it's an atrocity. Coming back, in this round, Mike's culinary skills fell short compared to Kashia's offering, leading to his defeat. His pride was wounded, and he couldn't fathom why GR would casually discard his dish as if it were packaged dog food. Voicing his frustration, Mike said, I'm a little insulted. It's not like it's packaged dog food. But Ramsey, never one to shy away from confrontation, swiftly called him up to the front, demanding an explanation for his outburst. Caught off guard, Mike found himself at a loss for words. Ramsey, not one to tolerate insubordination, made it clear that if Mike had anything to say, he should say it to his face, not behind his back. Continuing our love for spectacular dishes, I am sure you'll remember Moe's Pasta by Monique Booker from season 14. When Ramsay inquired about her marinara sauce, Monique confidently revealed her secret. You know the worst part? To everybody's annoyance, she didn't even think she was wrong to use pre-made sauce. Instead, she continued giving attitude to Ramsay. Wow, what a joke. To nobody's surprise, she scored only one point, and the red team eventually lost the challenge. Speaking of pre-made food, Kevin Ridland's Chicken Caesar Piadina comes to mind as well. Ramsey wasn't exactly thrilled with the concept. In his eyes, a salad on top of a pizza was a culinary crime. But the worst was yet to come. That's not all. The horrors continued to persist. In a moment of blunt honesty, Ramsey looked Kevin dead in the eye and asked if he wanted to go home. Ouch. I think he really meant it. His elimination in episode 5 is easily one of the most brutal in the show's history. What made it even more surprising was how he seemed to disappear into thin air after being pulled from mid-service. No closure, no exit speech, just poof and out. Now let's be real here, Kevin had his fair share of struggles in the kitchen. Those scallops were his kryptonite, even after Ramsay showed him how it's done. It's gotta be frustrating to see someone stumble on the basics, especially when they've been given a crash course by the big man himself. Take Monterey's chicken dish, or whatever it was that made it to the plate. Well, whatever it was, it was in Season 9's Chicken Creation Challenge. Each chef had five minutes to grab a chicken inside the pen, and then choose an ingredient out of those available to create four chicken dishes. You only have one lonely chicken. When you cut that chicken up, make sure you have a portion that is good enough to show off that dish. The judges were Jen Garcia from People Magazine and Dave Carger from Entertainment Weekly Magazine. Monterey pulled the chicken off the grill, thinking it was cooked perfectly. But then, this is what happened. Wow. Ramsey, noticing something was amiss, turned to Tommy, his partner, and asked, The chicken, please. Tommy then revealed Monterey's costly mistake, but he quickly reassured everyone that the dropped part hadn't made it to the plate. The cutting board, and the end piece fell. Onto the floor. Yes. Unfortunately, Ramsey wasn't in the mood to even taste the dish after what had happened. Half the chicken is missing. So Jamie ended up snagging the victory in this round, leaving the score at two apiece. Monterey, realizing the magnitude of his error, stepped up and took responsibility for the whole thing. 
Ramsay's refusal to taste the dish clearly highlighted the severity of the mistake. And overall, it was a lesson learned from Monterey about the importance of precision. And, you know, not dropping things. Hey, at least be glad you didn't have to taste Gina and Carrie's dish, which ended up completely wrong. I was on the team with Carrie, and the chicken was completely raw in the center. I'm sorry, chef. Up next, how about giving Dave's crepe a taste? Or, on second thought, let me just have Ramsay describe it. I asked for a crepe, not a plate of crap. <laughs> yeah. It all went down in season six's crepe challenge, and the task was to whip up four crepes, each for a different mealtime. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, and dessert. It was honestly pretty amusing to see everyone repeatedly stumble and fumble while trying to create their perfect crepes. Well, what's astonishing is that, despite the struggle, they somehow managed to produce something pretty decent. Well, that is, everyone except Dave. Dave's attempt at a cream cheese and mixed berry crepe was, well, royally f***ed. Why is it full of gunk around the outside? It just looked like shit. not gonna lie. It looks like a plate of diarrhea. Not quite appetizing, huh? Let me do you one better. Not appetizing at all. And Van had some words of wisdom for us. It looks like diarrhea, man. I ain't eating that shit. Ramsey listened and flat out refused to taste it, and that's saying something. It was one of those rare moments when Sabrina managed to outdo Dave in the kitchen. And moreover, it was one of the few moments where the one-armed bandit took an L. Be glad you're tasting a winner's dish. Well, moving on, what we have here is by far the tastiest dish ever made on the show. Made by the greatest chef ever. Raj, who is pretty confident about his culinary experience, proudly served up his seafood and vegetable pancake. I am an executive chef, and I began cooking when I was 14 years old. Show me a dish. I was always the best cook in the kitchen, so I can't see why this would be any different. Yeah, yeah, I get it. It's a thing. Seafood pancakes. But as soon as Ramsay laid eyes on it, he was in for a surprise, because this so-called pancake looked nothing like the real deal. What? That is a pancake? It's a, yeah. Does that look like a pancake? On top of that, it was practically swimming in oil. On brand for a seafood pancake, but that doesn't make it much better. Oh, it's going for a piss. A pancake that pisses. Surprisingly, despite its appearance, Ramsay did find the seafood's taste pretty appealing. It's a shame because seafood actually tastes quite nice inside. However, the shocking presentation was a deal breaker for him, and he couldn't bring himself to award Raj a point for it. So the point went to Sabrina. You know, it's funny how Raj's dish often ends up on those top five worst signature dishes lists just because it's Raj, but truth be told, it's really not the worst out there. Ramsay actually gave credit where credit was due and complimented the seafood, saying that it tasted quite nice. Sure, the presentation was absurd as hell, and that's why it's on this list. I mean, if you call it a pancake, it should at least look like a pancake. But getting a quite nice from Gordon Ramsay of all people is no small feat. What do you think? And I wasn't BSing you about vegetable and seafood pancakes being a real thing. It's called okonomiyaki over in Japan, and man, are they delicious. While it's technically not always a mix of seafood and vegetables, shrimp and squid are pretty popular fillings for this savory pancake. And fun fact, the name is derived from the word okonomi, meaning how you like it, or what you like, and yaki, meaning grilled. What's more, many fans have already attempted to recreate the dish. After all, Raj brought it to Hell's Kitchen of all places, so why not? Next up, I'll give you three options to pick from. It was season three, the leftovers challenge, and like the name suggests, the chefs would be put to the test by working with leftovers. The challenge was all about turning previously used ingredients into a dazzling new dish. The teams were tasked with creating one appetizer and two entrees from a tray of identical leftovers, and they had a mere 30 minutes to make it happen. First up in the entree round were Jen and Josh. Jen presented her steak and eggs dish, but Ramsay was far from impressed. He bluntly stated that it looked like something straight out of a workplace cafeteria, and that he expected better from her. Half an hour to make that. 
But Jen had a bit of a revelation herself, realizing that the dish was actually Bonnie's idea and that she should have ventured into something different. On the other side, Josh brought forth his chicken leg with pea tendrils. Unfortunately, Ramsey wasn't pulling his punches here either. He tore into the dish. Just taste that sauce. Oof. It was overly acidic, and to make matters worse, the chicken was undercooked. The sauce is disgusting. Yeah. And it is just crap. Ramsey even mentioned that he had higher expectations for Josh, given that he was a professional chef. But he put it bluntly, the dish was terrible. And for those of you born in May, here you go. First challenge, I played it too early, and now I'm playing too late. I mean, half an hour. You're, uh, welcome. In the Seven Seas Seafood Challenge, each chef had the chance to pick a rival from the opposite team to compete against. The twist was that the chosen chef would then select a scroll, each representing a major body of water, which would determine the type of fish they'd have to cook with. Heidi decided to take on Johnny from the men's team, much to his chagrin, as he wasn't exactly a fish expert. Damn you, Heidi! This is not my thing. When Johnny picked the Atlantic Ocean scroll, the rest of the challenge was revealed. What will we have to eat? Lose it to now. And yeah, they had just 30 minutes to make it all happen. The bluefin tuna round was the first to be judged. When Heidi and Johnny presented their creations, Ramsey couldn't help but ask Johnny what in the world had happened to his bluefin. Look like it's being attacked by a cat. Wow. On the other hand, Heidi's sesame crusted bluefin tuna with a sake Asian stir fry was met with such high praise. Thanks to its elegant presentation, the dish earned her a point. With this, the women took the lead at 1 to 0, leaving Devin clearly frustrated by what he considered another case of Johnny's less than adequate plating skills. Got to start stepping up in these challenges and not repeat the same mistakes. And hey, he wasn't wrong. Previously in the ostrich meat challenge, Johnny took charge of both the ground meat stations. He had clear plans in mind, a deconstructed burger and chili, and he felt pretty confident. After all, he had experience cooking burgers back in his comfort zone, his home kitchen, and believed he would excel in this challenge. It'd be a challenge that I am gonna kill. Woo. Being the first to have his dishes evaluated, he faced off against Ryan and Shanna. His initial creation, a deconstructed Hawaiian bacon burger featuring grilled pineapple and bok choy, didn't quite hit the mark and received criticism for even its conceptualization. I'm, I'm perplexed a bit. Badly conceptualized. His second dish, a chipotle chili, also fell short, as it was described as dry and rather uninspiring, with Frederick Moran even comparing it to something pretty unappetizing. Looks a bit dry. It's a bit boring. It's kids' food. In the end, Johnny had to accept defeat in this round, losing out to the red team. For those of you born in May, be sure to double check for an extra ingredient in your dish, since Johnny's cooking it. And for me to be standing here right now, I want to rip out the beautiful hair in my head. Yeah, his hair. Sorry. Now, how about moving on to Dana's uh, award-winning dish? Anything to stop thinking about Johnny's hair? In the Creative Steak Challenge in season 10, it was all about pitting one member from each team against each other. They had this nifty slot machine to reveal their ingredients, which included the type of steak they'd be working with. Dana and Patrick were the first ones to take a spin, and when Dana gave that lever a yank, out came flat iron steak, potatoes, mushrooms, spinach, and a touch of blue cheese. Sounds great, right? Now, let's talk about what Dana actually made. She whipped up a grilled flat iron steak paired with sauteed spinach and cabernet infused mushrooms. The trouble was, her dish's presentation in the flat iron steak round was a bit of a mess. Yikes. Raj, at least you're in good company. As for Dana, it was a disappointing moment, but she hoped the flavors would at least redeem her dish. Unfortunately though, her hopes were dashed. 
Oh, and of course, there is the exceptional LA's signature dish. Fish and chips is a signature dish? Who are you, the United Kingdom? LA was the ninth chef to have her dish tasted by Ramsay, and like you saw, Ramsay wasn't impressed one bit. I mean, how can you butcher something as simple as that? And a dish so near and dear to Ramsay's heart, no less. Now, next up, I've got a bit of a dilemma about which of these two was better or worse. Maybe you can help me decide between the dishes presented by Manda and Alan in the duck challenge of season 15. Each chef paired up with someone from the other team in a canoe, and they had to snatch five rubber ducks, each sporting a different ingredient, and then rush back to Hell's Kitchen. They had a solid 40 minutes to turn those ducks into delectable dishes. Josiah Citrin, the guest judge, was in the house, and both he and Ramsay were gonna rate these dishes on a scale of one to four. The one with the most points would walk away with the victory. Now, let's break it down. Manda's duck dish didn't quite hit the mark. Her concern was on point. Well, part of it, anyway. It did end up overcooked, and Ramsay didn't hold back, likening the taste to pork. Needless to say, that was a major letdown for Manda, who really hated disappointing Ramsay. She managed to score two points. Then, Alan's dish, featuring duck with deep-fried collard greens, didn't exactly hit the mark either. It ended up being criticized for being too greasy and somewhat bland. Yeah, it looked inedible. He too scored just two points. I mean, even Frank, who had never worked with duck before, even his dish was pretty impressive. Either way, in other words, Alan and Manda just couldn't deliver. You hate to see it. Now, if you want to take revenge on someone, then you gotta have Bonnie's contemporary cheese course on your menu. Ramsey had quite a bit to say about it. In fact, he had a lot to say about it. Ooh, it's different. So you're pretty new at this? Yes. Yeah, I can see that. It did, but in a bad way. To him, it looked less like a cheese course and more like a deconstructed mango cheesecake. The interesting part was, Ramsay not only found it lacking, but he also made it clear that the dish put Bonnie's inexperience front and center. You can imagine that wasn't exactly music to her ears. Okay. And now, you better brace yourselves for this next dish. In the first half of Season 7's Pork Creation Challenge, Nilka made a determined dash to capture her pork partner. Her eyes were fixed on the bacon collared pig, and she went all out trying to catch it. But this particular swine turned out to be quite the elusive creature. Oh my god! Damn bacon! <laughs> After what can only be described as an exhilarating chase, she finally cornered the one, adorned with a blood sausage collar. Now, when Fran selected prunes, Nilka couldn't help but raise an eyebrow. Prunes didn't exactly scream appetizing to her, and she's not alone. The words blood and sausage might evoke some unsavory mental images, but imagine how those flavors would collide with prunes. I mean, seriously, what was Scott thinking when he paired Nilka and Fran together? As they began cooking, neither of them felt particularly confident because they had never worked with blood sausages before. Not to mention attempting to pair them with prunes of all things. Is it supposed to be mushy? Yeah. I Wait, aren't they supposed to be firm and juicy? Things quickly took a disappointing turn when they pulled their creation out of the oven. It was a complete flop, and they both knew it. Nilka felt a sinking feeling in her stomach, and Scott chimed in, suggesting they should have pricked those sausages before cooking. Later, when it was time to plate their dishes, Nilka and Fran were the only ones who didn't wear a confident expression. When Ramsay tasted their dish, well, let's just say the swine-inspired dining experience was far from perfect, and leave it at that, okay? <sighs> Nilka, clearly unimpressed from the start, spilled the beans and admitted she wasn't pleased with what they had done. But a furious Ramsay demanded answers. Fran shot daggers at Scott, the one who had the initial idea but conveniently kept quiet, refusing to take responsibility. Uh, sorry for the bad pun. You see, I needed to break the tense moments. Meanwhile, Nilka boldly declared she'd prefer to serve an empty plate. 
but Ramsey was in no mood to give them any slack. The dish was a complete disaster, although let's be honest, it didn't look very appealing from the start, now did it? Now, for those of you who don't know, the next signature dish is apparently Ramsey's absolute favorite. It's fine. Virginia's dish was a coconut and pomegranate celery root salad. But before you celebrate too early, let me paint the full picture for you. She might have seemed promising at first, but the reality was quite different. It's fine. As far as rabbit food goes, because it's all raw and crunchy. In all honesty, she got exactly what she deserved. Her plate contained nothing that had been cooked. Instead, during those critical 30 minutes, all she did was toast some nuts. And I know it's a good salad. A rabbit might like it. I don't, I don't think rabbits like coconut milk. Okay, let's spice things up, shall we? And when I say spicy, I mean dishes that were too hot for even Ramsay to handle. First, Jessica's Cajun crabs. Cooked slightly Cajun style with a spicy aioli. Aioli is very hot. Then there's Nilka's chicken wings with a bottle full of Tabasco. Jesus. That's gonna blow your ass about that. Burn my mouth. Nobody gets a. Or how about Maribel's Argentine plantain soup? Yeah, and this one couldn't take any criticism of her dish. Well, at least nobody got Antonia's gumbo. So, which is the most absurd dish you've come across on the show? Make sure to drop them in the comments. So, in episode 3 of season 18, Heather was in charge of the garnish station with Kevin during the Marine Service Challenge. But when Jen started struggling with the salads, Heather stepped in to help. All right, I'm gonna help you with the salad, so come and shave the farm, and I got okay. that. Heather was low-key wondering how Jen could ever become an executive chef if she couldn't handle something as simple as a salad. And, well, that thought crossed my mind, too. But Heather came to a quick realization that she was actually supposed to be working the fryer, not doing Jen's job for her. I'm supposed to be over on the fryer. One of each one. That's, that's, that's it. As if that wasn't enough, when they moved on to the entrees, the meat station was almost ready to go out, but sadly, the fries ran into some issues. There's no fries in the water right now, and we got steak coming up. While Heather was obviously at fault here, she simply couldn't accept any blame whatsoever. There's three other people on that side. Nobody else, apparently, can drop french fries. She blamed the others for not firing up the stations for her. In that sarcastic, thanks, she dropped, when she pointed out that there were three other capable folks who could have done it while she was busy assisting Jen. Absolutely disgusting. Meanwhile, Ramsey was still waiting on Heather for those fries. Ten seconds out, Chef. Heather, I mean, fries. Just fries. She thought they needed another 20 seconds, but Kevin wanted them out stat. And in a rush to deliver, Kevin didn't bother, you know, checking to make sure they were okay first. I didn't think cooking french fries was that difficult. So, with that context in mind, it shouldn't come as much of a surprise that they landed on the customers' tables undercooked. We'll take a bite out of you, see? It's, like, it's not cooked all the way. Hard. Marino sent them back to the pass, and Ramsey all but threw those nasty raw potato sticks because, let's be real, those were not fries in the veterans' faces. Look! Look nope. what we're down to. Chef, I apologize. Ramsey made it clear that the rookies were running away with the service. But despite the setback, Heather managed to get the refire accepted. Unfortunately for the veterans, they lost. And Heather was feeling pretty embarrassed about the whole mess. But the worst was still to come. Guess what their punishment was? You remove all the internal, or take off that skin, that membrane. Preparing squid for a calamari dish in the upcoming night's service. And trust me, that's not the easiest thing to do. Have you ever tried it? Let me know in the comments, but I'll buy the frozen pre-sliced stuff any day. And if you're lazy like me, then don't forget to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. I know it's a lot of effort, but keeping up with my videos is well worth it. Anyway, it was a tough service for Heather. And trust me, what I've got up next wasn't any easier for this next band of intrepid chefs. And oh, by the way, the shoe was going to be on the other foot as far as the Marines were concerned. Don't get what I mean? Well, stick with me here. In season 15, episode 12, things got spicy during dinner service when Frank was holding down the fish station. 
right off the bat, he seemed to have a problem with Danny. I need a solid three minutes to the window. Let's go, <laughs> me, bro. It was clear he wasn't happy with that poor excuse for communication, especially because of this. It sucks because her ups can make it look like it was my up. Then the snapper saga unfolded. Frank, speed up, let's go. Roll fish. How thick is the fish? Very thick. Frank snappers that hit the pass were raw because they were cut thicker than the night before. But instead of owning up to it, guess what he did? If I tell you to watch something, just watch it, you know? I mean, don't send it abroad. He blamed Manda for sending them up as is. But wait, there's more. When Ramsey called him out for being slow with the refires, Frank got defensive. Ramsey urged him to bounce back, accusing him of switching off. And let's just say Ramsey wasn't exactly a fan of his reaction. Yeah, we switched off no, now, no, yeah? No, yeah. No, no, I really have. Well, look at his face! Oh, he was definitely pissed. So much so that it came down to threatening him. Young man, would you like to go home? No, I, I'm good. To add to the chaos, Frank tried to shirk his duties. I got two, two snaps right, in the pizza right. oven, thank you. Yeah, because why check your own dish, right? Just offload the responsibility on poor Jared. But don't worry, he saw through the clever game Frank was trying to play. Here we go, Frank just tries to pass the buck. You checking the snapper over there? Well, after some actual teamwork, imagine that, they managed to get the refire accepted. However, fate had other plans. Two of the same snappers hit the table with some issues. The customers were seriously annoyed at how raw their food was. Now, even at his most understanding, Ramsey would be pretty upset, right? But hold on, Ramsey was about to get a whole lot scarier. They're undercooked. Oh. Instead of his usual yelling, Ramsey didn't say a word. Nope, he just tossed the whole dish into the trash, Joe style. And if Ramsey's channeling Joe of all people, you know you messed up. Now, in spite of it all, Frank was still playing that tired old blame game. Because I'm getting by everybody else and I'm dragging now on fish because of them. He was fuming at everyone, claiming they were screwing up his dishes. But let's be real here, they were his dishes. But Jared's stripling coming out overcooked definitely didn't help, and Frank wasn't having it. At this point, I mean, you need to prove that you could cook steak. Later that night, Frank gave Jared a piece of his mind, telling him not to mess up Manda's game by sending his fish up before her garnishes. And Manda chewed him out for it too. Enough with the attitude. <laughs> God. Props to Manda for having the courage to get into a Marine's face when he was in the wrong. That takes some real bravery. Anyway, the blue team had to nominate two for elimination after losing the service. Because yeah, they lost. During the deliberation, Frank went aggro on Danny. Jared considered Frank for elimination. And when Manda called him out on his attitude, things went downhill. Like, no, look I'm how not looking for negative a fight. you're being. You really just want to round me up. Frank refused to bend backward for his teammates anymore and claimed she had a ton of attitude that night. And you gotta hear what he called his teammates as he stormed off. They just suck. Now you can talk about me because I'm walking away. Not exactly a dream teammate, huh? In the end, Frank became the second nominee for the blue team with Jared being the first. During his plea, he had the audacity to paint himself as a team player while blaming his teammates for sending out the raw snappers in the same breath. And surprise, surprise, Frank got the boot. Frank's last night because of a popularity contest. The blue team never had any drama. Wasn't really a huge surprise. In his exit interview, Frank believed he got the boot over a popularity contest, claimed the blue team never had drama until the women joined, and made a rather controversial remark about sending female Marines back to wherever they came from. Oh wow, and he was a misogynist too. Dude was full of surprises. But Ramsey always gets the last laugh. Unfortunately for him, he's just not ready for the rank of head chef. Now, Ramsey struggled to keep his cool after those snappers were sent back by the customers. But mind you, seeing VIP customers sending back their dishes would send him on a one-way trip to blow up town. And that's exactly what happened in season 12, episode 6. 
So in this particular episode, Ramsey decided it was time for both the teams to appoint a leader for the upcoming service. Anton saw the logic in Ramsey's request and advocated for someone to take charge. He threw his own hat into the ring. Super subtle, dude. Anton, what are you guys? That's how I look at it. I'll take it. We need a strong player. However, Jason wasn't convinced. Anton's just too much of a dick. He thought Anton was too much of a dickhead to be a leader. Can't say the guy wasn't blunt. Anyway, although Jason acknowledged Anton as a strong cook, he hadn't seen an ounce of leadership out of him. On the other hand, Gabriel was enthusiastic about the role. Anton couldn't believe it and burst into laughter, questioning if Gabriel was fucking crazy. Despite Gabriel calling him out on it, Anton kept arguing. Because I know my abilities. I know I can do this. I do this every day already. Once they returned downstairs, Anton confidently declared himself the men's leader. Yeah, no election, no nothing. Just swooped in and took the role. However, Gabriel wasn't buying it. He's going to try to lead with his mouth and put his foot in his ass. That's what I think. Anton explained that, due to extensive experience, which slightly offended Richard, he would act as a floater. Safe to say, things were gonna get interesting, especially with Gabriel doubting how well he'd do. During the prep for dinner service, Ramsey took Anton and Melanie aside for a quick 30-second meeting, making it clear that their role as captains had already begun. He overheard the women trash-talking them and was not happy about it. The girls are too cocky. Way too cocky. I want to take Melanie down. Yeah, Ramsey wanted to take Melanie down a peg for sure. As dinner service kicked off, Anton started being a floater, just like he'd said. He directed Ralph and Gabriel in making the risottos, hoping that if his team listened to him, they could pull off a strong service. However, he made one thing clear. If somebody's not listening, somebody's not cooperating, I'll throw them out of the kitchen myself. Despite some skepticism from Gabriel and Richard sarcastically calling him Super Chef, the first order of appetizers was accepted, and Anton was pretty pleased with himself. Yeah, I'm doing my own fucking horn right now and just jump up and down. Good job, guys. Good job. His leadership appeared to be working as the Blue Kitchen sent out a string of strong dishes. However, that success definitely went to his head, because Anton accidentally did something he shouldn't have. And the blue team is off to a solid start. One order. 30, 30 seconds. He talked over Ramsey's call out for the next door. Shut the f up. So you sorry, do your Jack. bit, then I wait, then I start, and you f***ing blur all over me. Yep. Even leaders have to follow the rules in Ramsey's kitchen, self proclaimed leaders especially. Now, when Holly Marie Combs ordered scallops, Anton walked Chris's scallops, but unfortunately, they had a massive issue that they'd overlooked. They're overcooked. They turned out to be overcooked. And Anton pointed the finger at, um, any guesses who? You're making me look bad because you're not doing your job right. Yeah, Chris, without a shred of doubt, too. Because, like, when should the captain ever need to go down with the ship, right? And it wasn't like he was responsible for expediting, right? <sighs> An hour into service, Anton went back to Chris for the scallops, instructing him to re-sear them on one side. Chris flat out told Anton to shut up. And when Ramsey briefly left the blue kitchen, Anton decided to take matters into his own hands. He skipped Chris's or Ramsey's approval, plated, and served the dishes for the VIP. Any guesses how well that strategy went? Are those undercooked? They are? And, well, they wasted no time in escalating the issue to Ramsey himself. Now, as bad as it was that Anton skipped out on Ramsey's final approval, it's worth noting that Chris continuously messing up was a major issue on its own. So, Anton had to pay extra attention to his third attempt at the scallops. And finally, they were accepted. In the end, the blue team managed to win the service, and Anton was praised by Ramsey for it. Not a bad recovery, considering the, well, everything earlier. The red team's troubles definitely worked in the blue team's favor that night. But imagine eating something awful on your own special day. Well, Megan's day was ruined thanks to her special birthday meal, courtesy of Hell's Kitchen. In season 20, episode 6, during Megan's 21st dinner service, Peyton found himself at the meat station with Sam. Things were already off to a horrible start when they served a rare steak on the first ticket. 
Especially because that got Ramsey into a bad mood at the first possible opportunity. Pat, hurry chef, up. Yes, chef. First table, guys. Jesus Christ. Let's see if they'll ace the refire. It's undercooked. It's raw white fat. Come on, back in the pan. Yes, chef. In spite of all that raw fat, I don't think I've ever seen Ramsey being so patient after a back-to-back -back mess up. But when Megan ordered the pad thai, Peyton was pretty confident. Some noodle dishes before. It's a, it really is a simple concept. However, when the dish reached Megan, all that so-called perfection was nowhere to be found. That is so good. That is no. Oh, Yours isn't good. Even her friend wasn't impressed. That's terrible. <laughs> this led to that dish making a quick round trip back to the kitchen. Let me take care of this. Thank you okay. very much. My apologies. And you better believe that Ramsay was going to make them taste it. So what does that taste like to you? Nothing. Nothing, Jeff. Ramsay demanded to know who seasoned the noodles. Initially, there was silence, until Peyton finally confessed that he cooked the dish. Keanu dropped a hell of an insult when he accused Peyton's brain of being a tangled bundle of noodles. But Marino rubbed salt into his wound when he revealed this. The one in the blue, they say they are fantastic, so go back to your drawing board. <sighs> you love to see it. Despite the rough start, Peyton managed to get his refire accepted. Later in the service, Peyton was among the five chefs responsible for the raw lamb. Yeah, ten whole eyes on it, and it was still ruined. And also, yeah, Ramsay was pissed. I'm on my knees because I'm cutting the fat quickly. All of you, get out! Well, there goes the red team. In the aftermath of that disaster, the red team was staring down the barrel of elimination. And Ramsay asked the team to nominate three chefs this time around. Now, this is when something interesting happened. During the deliberation, Bryn threw a bunch of issues in Peyton's face, questioning him about anything and everything. I know what meat feels like when it's done. I do. I'm the one who ran into the past and took it out of the oven. But Josie was pretty honest when she brought this up. And you thought it was good? I thought it was good. But Bryn stayed on the offensive. No. Like, I, I didn't know. Were you no, just no you, but you have to have an answer. Peyton didn't have a single good word in response to the pad thai problem, which Keanu wasn't super happy with, especially since he was responsible for cooking the dish for Megan. Pan, like, it's her birthday. You can't just be putting up scraps. In the end, Peyton found himself named one of the three nominees, alongside Sam and Josie. And boy, was he not happy about it. I'm so angry I'm crying. Like, I'm not crying because I'm upset that I got kicked out. I'm crying because I'm pissed with the steam. Safe to say, not exactly the easiest deliberation the red team's faced. During Peyton's plea to stay, he finally owned up to his mistakes, even acknowledging how bad serving Megan bland noodles was. Chef, I know I made some mistakes, and I feel absolutely about it. Despite expressing his growth and determination, he was eliminated. But Ramsey also had a kind word for the guy in the same breath, so it wasn't all bad. And right now, you are not ready to become my head chef. Peyton was disappointed, but he still loved the journey he'd had the chance to go on. But I gave his daughter a entree on her 21st birthday. Honestly, the attitude here is super refreshing. Ramsey had the final word, as usual. He said, Peyton struggled on the blue team and the red team. One thing's for sure, I don't want him on my team. It was a tough end for Peyton, but I can't say he didn't learn a thing or two during his time on the show. But if an Italian consulate sends back a dish, then consider it game over. In season 13, episode 7, during the Italian night dinner service, Ashley was working the fish station. But she was forced to redo her tagliatelle due to Rose Steak coming out blue and she sarcastically thanked her for the extra work. But later, the crazy got kicked up a notch. One dish seems to be leaving the dining room and making its way back to the kitchen. Yeah, I'm not even gonna bury the lead here. The calamari came back from the Italian consulate table for being raw. I'm sure Ramsey will keep his cool about that tiny little mistake, right? R right? Touch that. Raw, yeah. Well, I guess MasterChef Junior Ramsey had left the building. So, bye bye red team. All of you, get out. Just leave me alone, get out.
As both teams were named joint losers, they had to come up with two nominees each. Ashley was up for consideration thanks to Sade and Latasha, and this is why. This is the first bad service that I've had. Well, in her defense, Ashley said, A quarter of a million dollars, I just want to work for Chef Ramsay. She made it clear that it was her first bad service and emphasized that her primary goal in the competition was to work with Ramsay, not just take the 250k and run. Still, the team had a hell of a mountain to climb to find their nominees. On the team. Can I finish talking Go before right you? Okay. But if you're gonna repeat my words, say it right. But eventually, Ashley became the red team's first nominee with Row on deck. Aaron and Steve joined them from the blue team. When it was her turn to argue her case, Ashley acknowledged her singular bad dinner service and was appropriately remorseful. I will work fish station every single day to fix my mistakes. She promised to work diligently every single day to rectify it. Unfortunately, her words fell on deaf ears. No second chances for her. Ramsey deemed her mistake at the consulate table unacceptable. In her exit interview, Ashley revealed that she didn't expect to be eliminated that night, feeling that others had performed worse than her. Being in the competition was all she wanted, and she just couldn't hold her tears back anymore. I mean, Chef Ramsay obviously just thought that I wasn't good enough. <laughs> but still, Ramsay just thought she didn't have what it took. And, well, I can't say he was wrong. But this next incident could have easily landed the customer, or, well, victim more aptly, in the hospital. In season six, episode six, uh, what is it with all these episode sixes, I swear? Wait a minute. Season 12, episode six. Season 20, episode six. Season six, episode six. Six, six, six. What did Hell's Kitchen mean by this? Anyway, during dinner service, Sabrina was struggling real hard on the meat station. When Ramsay asked for the chicken, she claimed to have sent it up already, and was really confident about that assertion. However, it was nowhere to be found at the hot plate or any table, prompting Ramsay to order her to, well, cook a chicken. So they had a chicken to serve, obviously. Then she struggled with carving the chicken and brought Suzanne in to help, who walked her through what should have been a straightforward 30-second job. Despite the assistance, the chicken was still torn to ribbons, and Sabrina blamed it entirely on the person who selflessly tried to help her. But things didn't get any better when a raw pork dish came back to the hot plate. Inedible. Perhaps a little too quickly. This time around, Sabrina actually took responsibility for it. But that didn't make Ramsay much happier. Give me a fucking answer. It's me. Yeah, was it? Oh. oh. However, the real blunder here happened a little later. Raw lamb. Sabrina claimed that it was cooked medium well when she sent it out, so she came to the obvious conclusion that the customers were somehow in the wrong. But Ramsay saw the lie, or just plain stupidity maybe, for what it was. Both teams lost, and Ramsay was particularly upset at Sabrina for having the gall to blame the customers. Each team had to nominate one person for elimination, and if you didn't think Sabrina was going to get nominated, I don't know what to tell ya. She joined Andy from the blue team, but managed to secure another chance in the competition. But honestly, Andy was completely robbed. Well, I never want to eat anything ever again. But if you want to mess with me even more, get in the comments and tell me about other nasty dishes that made it to the customers' tables. Also, don't forget to check out my latest video right here. It's even crazier.